Good morning and welcome to The Morning Scoop for Friday, October 9th, 2020. This is your daily Buckeye Fix. I'm Tom Orr. The first football Saturday of the Big Ten season, 15 days away. The first football Friday night of the Big Ten season, two weeks from tonight. The game against Michigan, 63 days away. There are only two more weekends of football before the Buckeyes kick off their 2020 season. So if you still need to go apple picking or take the kids through a corn maze, time is running out. Better make the most of your time this weekend. Uh, if you are able to sit around and watch football this weekend instead, there is a really solid slate of games. Uh, Buckeye Scoop Stephanie Odie is my guest this morning. Stephanie, is there one game that jumps out to you as the one you're maybe most interested or most intrigued by uh, this weekend? I like the Texas one, uh, mainly because, uh, like I mentioned to you earlier, I, to- I talked to Urban earlier today, and we addressed, you know, what what's going on in Texas. They have so much potential. They got a great quarterback in Sam Ellinger, and he said it best, Sam did, is that he thinks that they're just beating themselves, that these are self-inflicted wounds that they could just work together and fix. So I'm curious to see how they can regroup and work through some kinks that maybe are internal. And so with a Red River rivalry, it'll be interesting to see how that one pans out. Yeah, that's, that's uh, number 22, Texas, and unranked Oklahoma. And I don't think three weeks ago you would have gotten real good odds on Texas is ranked 22nd, and they're the higher ranked team of the two. That is uh, at the Cotton Bowl at the Texas State Fair, obviously going to be a very, very different atmosphere uh, this year than it is in a typical year. Uh, oddly, Oklahoma, a two and a half point favorite in that one. But it is bizarre to me, Stephanie, that you can have at the end of this weekend, either both of these teams are going to have two losses, and it's not even mid October yet, or Oklahoma is going to be 0 and 3 in the Big 12. Like, both of those seem completely impossible, and yet one of them is definitely going to happen by the end of the weekend. Yeah, Oklahoma is so surprising to me, especially in the first game. I thought that was just maybe a whoopsie, but for them to be where they are right now, it's, it's odd. And Texas should take advantage of that, but they, they have had some issues. So it, it's going to be pretty much who can pull it together themselves. I think it's within their own team, not so much their opponent, but like, can they get it together to, to make it work? Yeah, te- Texas is such an interesting program because they have all the resources in the world. It is the flagship state institution of the state with the best high school football in the country. And they just cannot seem to get it on track. And they've, it's, they've, it's been through multiple coaches. They've changed athletic directors, changed coordinators. And there's just, there's just this constant just underperformance there. And you know, Urban Urban Meyer is someone whose name has been linked to that job. I don't I don't know how uh, how much validity there is to that, or if that's just Urban Meyer's name gets linked to every potential open job at this right. point. But I mean, do you have any sense, or did he have any sense, like what what the issue is there? I mean, it just it just seems yeah. like it's been it's been such a consistent issue for so many years that there there has to be something that's like culturally wrong there. Right. And that's exactly what I asked Urban. He doesn't want to speculate, uh, you know, being from outside the program, but he's kind of, he's the culture guy. He can make any program a winning program, get guys motivated, bought in. And Texas, I lived in Texas. It's a big football state. You would think that many recruits would go to Texas, but we do see them going to places like Ohio State, Alabama. So I think it's, also the continuity, like you said, there, there's circulations in the coaching scheme. So if like one guy recruits you and then you're playing for another guy, it doesn't work out so well. So when there's so many changes and, you know, the, the culture there too. So it, there's questions, not so much on the talent side, but something's not clicking. And you got to think that it's something inside the building, especially in a year with a pandemic and there's so much adversity you add that in, that's going to be hard for any team to come together, but they had pre-existing issues that they haven't worked out. And I think that consistency would be the key there. Well, a couple teams that have not had any trouble coming together this year, number one, Clemson, number seven, Miami, they face off Saturday night in, uh, in Death Valley. Uh, Clemson, a two touchdown favorite. This is the game day game this weekend. I, I have been very impressed with Clemson so far, Stephanie. They, it seems like Clemson and Alabama have just kind of They've been fine. You wouldn't know there was anything unusual this year. They've just kind of done what they were supposed to do the first couple of weeks. What, this, is, this is an intriguing matchup, though. I mean, I think there's a reason Clemson's favored by a couple of touchdowns here, but Miami will be like the first pretty good test for, for Clemson right. to see, 
you know, are, are, can they keep that moving? Can they just kind of keep the machine rolling against a little bit of a better opponent? Well, that's a good transition from Texas. I think Clemson's a place that has continuity and they have consistency. When you get there, you know what to expect. So I think that'll help definitely benefit them in this game. But Miami is a competitor. But like we said, you know, before we started recording is that Clemson's solid. You know, it's hard to question them, maybe until that Notre Dame game. But even still, it's really hard to bet against Clemson at this point. But it'll be a good test nonetheless. Yeah, this Miami team, I mean, I think, I think over the years, I have kind of rolled my eyes at Miami the same way I kind of roll my eyes at Texas, where every year it's, oh, they, is Miami back? Is Texas back? And the answer is always no. This year might be a little bit different because Miami, you know, normally whenever Miami is not winning, the, the problem gets diagnosed as like a swag deficiency. Like, well, they don't <laughs> have the swag of the late of the 1990s teams. It's like, well, they also don't have the really good players of the late 90s teams. So they seem like they've brought in, especially from the talent, uh, from the uh, transfer portal, they've brought in like Jalen Phillips, the defensive end from UCLA, who was a top overall player in the class in the country a couple of years ago. Derek King, the quarterback, all of a sudden they've got a quarterback, probably the best quarterback they've had since in 15 years, maybe, but they've also, they're better in the trenches this year. That's the thing that stands out to me. That's like, okay, maybe there's something here. It's not just, well, we've got some speedy skill guys and maybe we can do something with them. Like they, they actually have some substance there, which is not something they've had uh, a lot. A, a program that definitely has a lot of substance to it. Number two, Alabama. They are 23 and a half point favorites at Ole Miss this weekend. I mean, Alabama is one of those, there's not that many teams that have just looked kind of automatic and just, yes, we are doing the thing that we should be doing every week. Clemson, Alabama, I'm expecting Ohio State to do that when Ohio State gets Mm -hmm. a chance to play. But Alabama has just, you know, last year's, you know, has Nick Saban lost it? All of those conversations, they they feel like, "Mm, I think the answer may be no. I think Nick Saban may still have it. I'm going back to consistency on that one. I mean, he's got such a track record. You know, no one's perfect. Even Urban had a loss here and there. But for for someone to question whether or not Saban still has it, I I, I think that'd be naive. But, you know, I when it comes to the SEC and Alabama, I do think that there is one team that could beat them this year, and that's Florida. And so I think that will be a test. But Alabama this year, I'm not as confident in as I am Clemson, if if we're going to compare the top teams. But, again, consistency. Alabama's always a contender. So that'll still be a game that'll be a good example of what to expect for those bigger games as well. Yeah, this will probably not be as much of a test as last week against uh, that. Last week they were uh, at Texas A&M. Oh, no, sorry. They were home for Texas A&M last week. And uh, it was 14 to 14 in the second quarter. It was like, oh, is this, is this going to be a thing? And then very emphatically, no, that was not a thing because uh, Alabama rolled off a 21 to 7 uh, advantage in the second quarter. Mac Jones line from last week. 20 for 27, 435 yards, four touchdowns, one interception. Uh, I think Mac Jones maybe came into the year as a little bit of a question mark for some people. Like, is he going to be able to live up to the Tua level of play? And uh, that was a pretty emphatic yes. Yes, he can. So with that, I mean, that's, that receiver core is scary, scary good. Uh, another SEC team that is definitely in the, in the playoff p- uh, picture, number three, Georgia. They, they're going to get their first real test this week. They host number 12, Tennessee, 12 and a half point favorites for the dogs. You know, I mean, I, I'm not sold on Tennessee yet. I don't know about you, Stephanie. I, they're fine. I, I think that uh, number 12 is probably a little generous and a little bit of a function of the fact that uh, two thir- two fifths of the uh, power five is not playing yet. And another fifth of the power five is just basically eliminated itself already. So it's they're They're basically number 12 out of the SEC and ACC for the most part, but is Georgia a team that you see being a like a legitimate playoff contender? And if so, what, what does this weekend look like against Tennessee? Honestly, if, if I had to bet on a game, it would be this one to go with an underdog. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but what we saw earlier from Georgia did make me lose a lot of confidence in them, especially with their quarterback situation and, you know, Jamie Newman opting out and things like that. But it, they don't seem solid to me. I feel like that, a lot of the times you can, they can make big plays, but it's not a guarantee type thing. Like, you know, they, they can pull it together, but you just don't know what you're going to get from them, I think, this season. I, I don't feel as confident in them right now. 
Yeah, the offense is definitely a, a pretty good, pretty big question mark for them. The defense is very, very good. They they played Alabama or excuse me Auburn last week, and uh, it was they gave up four point four yards per pass and like one point eight or so yards per rush, which is uh, I don't know if you know anything about football. That's pretty good, dear <laughs> listener. That is pretty darn good if you're a defense. So uh, yeah, the, the but you know in terms of in terms of a point spread, you know if they give up ten. They they might only score twenty one against Tennessee and then ta da Tennessee has covered so yeah that that is that is that's that's a reasonably big number for a team that has some definite question marks on offense. I think it would definitely be a low scoring game. Yeah yeah bet, bet the under on Georgia this year is probably not a terrible idea. Uh, <laughs> a team you might not want to bet the under on Florida. Uh, they are a six and a half point favorite at Texas A and M. Florida number four in the country. Texas A and M number twenty one. I, I mean. You had you had thoughts on the Gators, so I'll let you go first. Yeah, I mean, I talked a lot about uh, to my friend who covers the Gators when I thought we weren't going to have a Big Ten season. So I said, okay, I'll jump on the Gator train, but I really like what they have going there. Kyle Trask is an experienced quarterback. They have 16 starters returning. Their coordinators are in their third year together. There's just so much that they've grown together in. And when they can take advantage of that this season, when teams are going through a lot of issues opt-outs, pandemic protocols, all of that, they can really use that to their advantage. And they're just in a rhythm right now. I think that they mesh well together. They got a good flow. And I, I, don't, I, don't, I think that they can be everyone on their schedule too. So, you know, so I, I, I'm confident in the Gators and I, I love watching them this season too. Yeah, I think that we, Tony Gerderman and I did an episode of Buckeye Weekly on Thursday, just dropped Thursday last night. And we talked about bold predictions for this season. One of my bold predictions was, Whoever wins the uh, cocktail party, Georgia and uh, Florida, is the fourth playoff team this year. I think Alabama gets in. I think Clemson gets in. I think Ohio State gets in. And whoever wins that game gets in too. And both of those teams are like good but a little bit flawed. Georgia, as we talked about, doesn't have a tremendous offense but has a great defense. Florida's offense has been very good so far. Kyle Trask has looked very, very good so far, but they gave up 35 to Ole Miss and 24 to South Carolina, and neither of those teams are, you know, playoff caliber teams. So you kind of have two sort of half teams there. This, this may be another year where you've got four playoff teams and you have three really good playoff teams, and the fourth one's like, yeah, and then there's a big step down. So that, that'll, that'll be something that's worth keeping an eye on. And I'm sure you will have plenty of folks on CBS and ESPN telling you all about how that second SEC team belongs in the playoff. Uh, number yeah. 21, yeah, number 21, Texas A&M, the team they're playing, boy, uh, they came in ranked number 10 this year. And uh, this is, this has not gone the way that uh, they, they were probably hoping they, they are, they, they got throttled. They barely beat Vanderbilt week one, 17 to 12. And, and it was, it was as bad as a 17 to 12 game sounds. It, it was one of those not as not as pretty as the score indicates kind of games because Vanderbilt got absolutely shellacked last week uh, by LSU. And then Alabama comes in, A&M hangs around for like a quarter and then just absolutely gets lambasted again. So 52, 24 last week for Texas A&M. That, that's I mean, there to me, that program is a little bit like Texas, where it's like you've got all the resource. You've got a coach who's making $75 million over the 10 years. And you, it's just kind of like, what, what do you have to show for it? See that that's another one of those programs that just like Texas seems like, yeah, this, this team should be better than it is. And it just somehow outside of that one Johnny Manziel season, it's just, they just kind of are what they are. And it's like eight and four every year. Yeah. I look on that team and I think who's the pure leader, you know, who, who's going to bring this team together and, and I'm, I'm questioning it. I think I do think it is a culture thing because they have so much potential. That's exactly what Urban and I talked about is, is something's going on where it's not clicking. And, and I don't think it's in the talent. I, th I think it's just, some, you know, maybe they're not playing for each other. There's certain times where you can see a guy not, not diving in for, for a play. So that could be it. I think, I think it's an internal motivation thing. So, something's not clicking. Number five, Notre Dame. In uh, ACC action, that is still weird to me. Notre, Notre Dame playing an ACC conference game against uh, Florida State, unranked Florida State, extremely, extremely unranked Florida State, who was 0-2, got their first win last week. Uh, they were trailing Jacksonville State, 14-0 in the first quarter, 21-7 in the second quarter, 24-21 in the third quarter, and ended up winning 38-24. B 
big win over an FCS team for Florida State at, and uh, Notre Dame a three touchdown favorite. This is one of those games that, you know, you, you put the helmets up on the graphic and it looks, wow, what, this is going to be a great game. And it's just, you look at this, it's like, oh no, this is, this is going to be bad and boring and over pretty early probably. Yeah. I think that's one where people will be flipping through yeah. and just, you know, catch it on commercial even because it, it's going to be like college versus high school almost, I feel like. Yeah. Florida State, they're, they're supposed to have Mike Norvell back this week after he had to sit out last week to, uh, due to a COVID test. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's going to make enough of a difference to, uh, to make that an interest, interesting game. The only other game with a top 10 team in action is, uh, boy, and this is another thing that sounds weird, uh, number eight, North Carolina, favored by five at home against number 19, Virginia Tech. Neither of these teams has done anything particularly impressive. They, they've kind of played sort of okay ACC teams and won both of their games. But, I mean, l- last week, North Carolina barely escaped against uh, Boston College. Jeff Halfley uh, had his team down 24-22 very late in the game, uh, going for a two-point conversion, and North Carolina picked it off and ran it back for a uh, you know two points of their own to finish with a 26-22 win. The week before that, uh, Boston College had barely, barely escaped by uh, Texas State. So I don't think Boston College is a uh, legitimate playoff contender this year. I, I mean, I know, I know North Carolina is kind of a trendy team for people to, to think, you know, that this is, you know, Mac Brown's really got it going the right way. And he's, he's brought in some pretty good recruits and, and he seems like he has it sort of headed in the right direction. But do you, do you see North Carolina as a, I mean, like a legitimate top 10 team? No, now that I had the schedule in front of me, the rating was surprising to me. Um, but I, I think that it's, I think that they can get there in a few years. You know, I think that they're on the right track. But to say that right now, a top 10, that was surprising to me. But no, yeah, I, I can see it down the road. Not, not right now. Well, you've uh, kind of mentioned this a few times. Just talk to Urban Meyer. Uh, that, uh, that's, that is an interview that I think uh, people listening to this podcast would probably find pretty interesting. Some, someone, someone that they may uh, be interested in his opinions on uh, football, football matters. Can you let people know kind of where, you know, where and when you'll, uh, you'll be putting that out? Yeah, I'll release it later in the day. Um, I, we cover a bunch of topics, you know, the Dwayne Haskins benching. Also on that roster is another quarterback he coached in Alex Smith and his unbelievable recovery. So, you know, I asked him if it was bittersweet that one of his quarterbacks gets benched, but one is a step closer back to the field in this miraculous recovery. We also talk about the culture issues that Texas is experiencing and in contrast, how Ohio State thrived through that and that this will be a huge test to that, but he's, he has full confidence that Ohio State will will excel in a year of adversity with the pandemic. So we dig into a lot of fun stuff. We'll, we'll put it on the website. We'll, we'll put it on YouTube, all of that. And um, it was a good one. I really enjoyed it. And especially I asked him if at all there'd be an opportunity to fill in for Coach Day if, by God forbid, Coach Day has a, a positive test. So you guys all have to tune in for that answer. <laughs> he did find yeah. it funny. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that'd be, uh, that would be quite a sight, Urban Meyer, returning to the sideline at, at Ohio State as the interim coach for Ryan Day after Ryan Day was the interim coach for Urban Meyer. That'd be quite a, quite a uh, turn of events. Stephanie, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, You can find that interview later today at BuckeyeScoop.com. You can also find all all of our great insider content there. We have a remarkable team of uh, recruiting and uh, just recruiting analysts and uh, team insiders and beat writer Tony Gerdeman and all all sorts of just incredible uh, writers and staffers there. And uh, you can find all of their coverage at BuckeyeScoop.com. As I mentioned off the top of the show, the season First week into the season, two weeks away. That means the first game week is one week away. One week away. So this would be a fantastic time. If you've been thinking about it, this would be a great time to become a member of BuckeyeScoop.com. You can just go to the website, sign up right there, get instant access, sign up for a month. It's the price of a lousy chain store pizza or a a case of uh, pretty lousy domestic beer. So you're better off, you know, say, you know, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll weigh a little less and know a little more if you spend that money on a Buckeye Scoop membership instead. So thank you guys for joining us. That was a fantastic us. plug. That yeah, was fantastic. Thank you. That was right very off, right well done. the top of my head. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm bought well, in. <laughs> well, Ste- Stephanie's in. Hopefully you are too. 
Have a great weekend. We will talk to you Monday.